Live from New York, it's Ask This Engineer. Hey everybody, and welcome to Ask Engineer. We're back as always, Wednesday nights. Uh, thanks for dealing with our schedule changes, but uh, we're gonna try to have a good one hour now where we check out what's going on Sorry. in the world of makers, hackers, engineers. It's me, Lady Ada, the engineer. With me, Mr. Lady Ada on broadcast control. And we're here at the Adafruta factory in the warehouse uh, where we do our manufacturing and kitting and shipping and coding and videoing. And like I said, we have a full hour uh, jam-packed of news videos, uh, treats, and more. So let's yeah. kick it right off. What's on, on tonight's show? On tonight's show, the code is BFF add-on. We'll show you why in just a few minutes. That's the code tonight. 10% off in the Adafruta store all the way up to 11.59 p.m. Eastern time tonight. We'll talk about our Adafruit Live Series shows, including Show and Tell. We've got some time travel with some awesome special retro tech. From the mailbag, this one's a little different this week. We're going to be talking about how to get a Raspberry Pi because there is a worldwide shortage. Main New York City factory footage, 3D printing, eye on MPI, new products, top secret. We'll answer your questions. We do that over on Discord, adafruit.it slash Discord, where you can join all 33,000 of us. We'll answer your questions towards the end of the show, but put them up in the chat all during the chat. We get to them all every single week. All that and more on, you guessed it, Ask an Engineer. Yay. Okay, Lady Ada, well, first up, let's pay some bills. BFF add-on is the code tonight. Um, it'll be on until I remember to turn it off or midnight, somewhere around there. Um, people get free stuff when they add stuff to their cart. That's right. What do they get? If you order from adafruit.com, we've got some freebie giveaways. $99 or more, you get a free Puma Proto half-size breadboard, that thing on the top left corner. It's the same size and shape as a half-size uh, solderless breadboard. Make your projects permanent. That's why we call it Puma Proto. Uh, top right corner, those are some STEM QT boards. Order 149 or more, and you'll get um, a different one, a different one of a sample of like a dozen different kinds that we have available. If you make an account, uh, we'll make sure to send you out a different one each time. Otherwise, it's random. And then uh, $1.99 or more, you get free UPS ground shipping in the continental United States. Okay, next up, we're doing a bunch of live shows. We do live shows every single week. And uh, this week, special thanks to JP, who did Show and Tell. Thank you, JP. Uh, we'll be back on Show and Tell next week. No Pedro did one before, we're alternating, so do check it out. Go to any of our social media platforms and check out the Show and tell. Uh, it just got published on YouTube right now. That's for a lot of people. Check it out. From the desk of Lady Ada, we do that every Sunday. We had uh, two parts this week, just like we always do. What was part one? What was uh, on your desk? Part one, desk of Lady Ada. We showed off this cool Flipper Zero. Um, we backed this on crowdfunding and it came in. That was fun. Also showed off uh, some STEM QT boards that we're working on. Um, some revisions we made. Uh, we we're trying to keep stuff in stock. And so some boards, if I can't get one package of a component in, um, I'm redesigning the PCB to handle another package. So uh, an RTC that I can't get an eight SOIC, I can get an HVSON. So it's time for revisions. So you're gonna see a lot of revisions. In fact, half the new products this week are revisions. Okay. And then we have the great search. And that's where you help people find the parts they need, which is uh, kind of a good thing right now because it's hard to find parts. It's going to be hard to find parts for another 18 months. So um, yes, this week um, I showed off the uh, finding an alternative triple axis magnetometer for uh, measuring um, the Earth's magnetic field. Um, there's two kinds of magnetometers, like high range and low range. So this is the low range type. I wanted something uh, affordable, uh, easy to use, I squared C, and most important, in stock. And I uh, found a couple good options. Okay. Then on Tuesdays, we do JP's product pick of the week. Um, this week I had a little bit of an observation. So JP's been um, really amping up the thumbnails. So this was uh, this week, he's a cat. And then I noticed it's like, it reminded me of that, uh, that Sega Dreamcast um, AI experience. It looks like a little bit like Elon Musk. I mean, I don't know if that's like, maybe that's his I, I think future evolution. This is, um, this is an advanced form of life. Um, so you could check out uh, the latest thumbnail and the latest cat? video. He's a cat, this is the thing. Okay. Um, so, so folks who know Dreamcast will, will remember this uh, game. It was kind of cool. And, Even a uh, tin can, right? Yeah, so uh, here is the latest product pick. 
It is the OLED Featherwing 128 by 64 display. You can use that Stemi QT port to add another peripheral. So this is Bongo Cat. And if I hold these, these are gonna play a little sweep on the Game Boy, original Game Boy audio hardware. The extra bonus here is that you can see I've plugged into the Stemma QT port a little accelerometer. And as I tilt that accelerometer, it's a variable that changes the rate of that sweep. It's a pretty short sweep if I'm at one, gets a little longer and even longer. On the side of the OLED, same pins as my Feather, Neokey Feather there. OLED Feather Wing, it's 128 by 64 I squared C display with Stemma QT port. All right, and then on Thursday we have JP's workshop and on JP's workshop we have, uh, <laughs> we have sirens in the background today. Uh, we have the Circuit Doesn't Python Parsec. Yeah, yeah the Circuit Python Parsec, take it away JP. What I wanted to talk about on the Circuit Python Parsec today is display rotation. So I've been doing this little series on display I.O. things, and often you'll display either text or shapes or bitmaps images onto one of the displays on a Circuit Python based board. When you display an image, you have a choice of your orientation. Is it essentially uh, a sort of horizontal display, either in that orientation or that orientation, or is it a vertical display, either that way or that way? And depending on how you have a thing mounted or how you're using it, you may want to pick different orientations. So what I have here is an example of some cool little pixel art. This is of a little Casio keyboard. And then when I press A, I can switch to a different image, but you can see this image has a vertical orientation. So it makes more sense to turn the screen this way. And when I do that, I'm going to want to switch the display rotation. So this changes everything to do with your display, all of the, uh, the values of where zero, zero is, for example, X and Y, all of those things get updated as you change this rotation setting. So if I go back to this horizontal image, I can switch that rotation there. And you'll see the way this works inside of CircuitPython. When you've set up your display, you can see this value, display.rotation is set to zero, and that's this sort of default but we can put it 0, 90, 180, or 270 to get those four different orientations. We can't do partial angles, just these four orientations. When I press one of these D-pad buttons, I'm simply updating that display rotation equals 0, 90, 180, or 270. Then I'm also using the A and B buttons to just do a sort of mini slideshow between images. And so that's how you can adjust display rotation inside of CircuitPython using display rotation. And that is your CircuitPython Parsec. Okay, and then uh, for folks that are fans of Deep Dive with Scott on Fridays at 2 p.m., there's a change. Scott is uh, now uh, <laughs> on break, uh, bringing some life into this world, uh, having a kiddo. So uh, this will be uh, maybe part of the new graphics we're doing. Uh, Tim Foamy Guy is doing the show, and I think we're going to call it Deep Dive with Tim Foamy Guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so right. that's, the, uh, that's the graphic. Okay. We're working on it. Okay, uh, time travel. Let's look around the world, makers, hackers, artists, engineers, and more. We have some news, uh, and the news uh, that you've probably heard in the news is... Uh, well, there's a lockdown in Shenzhen. So our Ada box that we wanted to ship in the winter is now turning to winter spring edition. So that is the flavor. Uh, it's blue green now. I'd really like to of, get these parts. <laughs> that's right. So um, we're sorry about that. We're going to continue to update the Ada box pages and hopefully we'll be able to ship soon. But thanks for hanging in there. We don't charge uh, you as a customer until we ship anyways. So thanks for sticking in there. We still have a bunch of, uh, let's see, signups. I think there's a few hundred signups. So if folks do, if you're like, hey, I don't wanna wait any longer, um, you could just pause your subscription, cancel it. You could do whatever you want. And then other folks can get in line. 
So we appreciate your patience. It's um, an exciting time out there. Yeah, we're all kind of dealing with uh, 52 week lead times. That's um, right. We don't think it'll be that long for Adabox. Um, we were shut down in 2020 in 2021 for parts of COVID and we still got all the data boxes out. So we're pretty confident we'll be able to continue to do that. So thank you uh, for your patience. More time travel. Um, we went to some art last week. So I wanted to show this, this is from Kelly Heaton and I have um, some photos. I, pay, I played some of the video in the beginning of the show and I'll play the full video, uh, but this is an exhibit. It's at, uh, let me go to the slide that I have here. Um, you can scan this in with your phone if you want. This is Five Manhattan West. Yeah, Five Manhattan West. And um, it's commissioned by Arts Brookfield and it's curated by Common Ground Arts. And you could check out uh, Kelly Heaton's work. You can just Google for Kelly Heaton. And this is Circuit Garden. And if there was a set that was Circuit Python, it would be this. And you can see all of the parts. Um, I'd say that Kelly's work is known for this like analog uh, bird electronics. Yeah, she's she, it's fully analog. There's there's a microcontroller that like turns things on, like that controls yeah. the relays, but the audio itself is all done with like op amps and yeah. flip flops. And there's an Arduino. Five there's five an Arduino. Timer. That's what controls what turns on and off. And there's um, a sensor, so when you walk by it. Um, the crickets chirp and the birds trill, and they all have different songs too, which is kind of cute. Yeah, um, and then uh, here's the artist. Tell In me. person. And then uh, here's a video. Okay, and mailbag can be a little bit different this week. Let me get my paperwork. Yeah, paperwork. So this week's mailbag is going to be all about the Raspberry Pi and what we're doing to cut down on um, people buying up all the Raspberry Pis and selling them on eBay, people making bots to buy up all the uh, Raspberry Pis, and it's just not being fair for folks to get Raspberry Pis. There is a uh, shortage around the world. So um, this mailbag is from a tweet, and this tweet is from a bot that looks at our site, and the bot that looks at our site will tell you it's when- It's a good bot. Yeah, well, I mean, bots aren't good or bad, it's That's what they true. do. Um, so there's a bot called uh, RPI Locator, and it'll tell you when there's stock anywhere that they follow, and they have tools that can, I think they're using Puppet or something like that. And um, folks notice right away, we now require verified accounts. So you have to have an account on Adafruit, and it has to have two-factor authentication. And uh, so far, so good. Uh, they still have some in stock. It appears that it's helping. Normally, stock has gone in seconds. That's great. And then um, the person behind this, I don't know them or anything, um, they noticed that this is helping the situation. And the situation is there's a lot of incentive for folks to uh, hoard these. And yeah. so. Um, and they make it worse because it's like now there's even less, right? Like I think yeah. people who really need them could get them if it wasn't that there are people who are purposefully 
trying to grab yeah. them to sell them. So for we've more. tried a few different things. Um, we've we've reached out to folks that were you know were, were like, hey, you're you're selling these on eBay. Please don't do that. Um, educators want these. There's a lot of companies that just they need one or two. Um, and it just got really difficult, and we don't have a lot. So sometimes we get like 50, and we put them in stock, and they and we needed to have something. So it was humans buying these, and we do have a limit of one per customer. So I'm going to um, read some of the things that we're doing. Did you and, want me to read it? Well, no, that's fine. Yeah. I'm going to read some of the things that we're doing, and then ask any questions, and then I'm sending this to our team because um, we've just le recently learned with security disclosures and everything else, you have to constantly update your information because people have questions and sometimes terminology is different. Sometimes things are different um, how uh, we word things. And so uh, authenticated accounts, two-factor authentication, all these things are somewhat new to people. So we also have a guide on our website on how to set this up. Anyways, um, here's going to be what we put on our uh uh, blog and have in an email so when folks say like hey how come I need an account I don't, can't use the guest account anymore um, why due to bots buying out certain high demand items such as Raspberry Pi for Model B we are now requiring a verified account with two-factor authentication for purchase we are working to ensure as many of you makers and engineers out there have the chance to order these items at market prices without having to compete with bots <laughs> We appreciate your patience and understanding and can't wait to ship your order. So we have the helpful tips, verify your account, you get an email, you verify it, and then you put on two-factor authentication. Um, so uh, a good idea would be to set up your account now and add two-factor authentication now. Um, log out of your account, back, log back in after it's all been verified. Uh, make sure all the information you have in your account is up to date. For instance, um, if you've changed your address or anything, uh, make sure that you update it because if you try to update it afterwards, we might have to cancel the order if it's already been shipped and then it goes back in the stock. Complicated things yeah, like that. Yeah, try to get, make sure all your info is correct. Know your address, your zip code, your email, address. make sure that's all good. Yeah. Um, sign up on the product page to get notified when you uh, do want to get notified. Um, we don't use that email for anything else and um, we don't send you uh, spam or anything. Um, you could, uh, one of the things that some folks do is they use a special uh, custom email address just for any type of correspondence on an online store. I think that's a good idea um, because then if it's ever used again, you'll know. Um, what else I got? Um, then we have a link to the guide on how to enable um, two-factor authentication. Yeah, it's not SMS. You're going to use an app or a computer program called Authenticator yeah. or Authy. It's a free app. I've also, um, if you want, I made a CircuitPython powered, I uh, mean, Brent both made CircuitPython powered uh, one time pad, um, sorry, time based, uh, you know, password authenticator thingies um, using a Pi Portal or other Raspberry Pi device. So you don't even have to use an app if you don't want. You can build your own uh, if you don't trust apps or if you just want to run it on your computer. So mm -hmm. a lot of options are available, but um, two factor. Um, as well, verified accounts has really, really helped cut down on the number of bots because we want to make sure that it's really one per customer and not one yeah. per customer per second, um, which was which is becoming a problem. And I think it worked this time because we had we put in a couple hundred Raspberry Pis and they lasted um, at least 15 minutes, and that's never happened before. They usually were all snapped up in two or three minutes by these uh, by these bots. Yeah. Okay. Um... So the feedback uh, that folks had, uh, so folks like the emails. That's good. Um, <laughs> kind of annoying that you have to have two-factor authentication for some items, but at least it's uh, TOTP based. Mm. So yeah. Yeah, no that. SMS. So yeah. that's good. Um, so yeah, it's a little annoying, and I, I want to manage. I don't want to do it. I right? want to manage expectations. I don't think there's going to be a surplus of parts and things. I think it's going to be harder and harder and harder to get electronic components. And so one of the things that we can do is at least try to make it as fair as possible. Uh, we won't always succeed, but this is just one of the many things. Also, two-step, uh, two-factor authentication is a good idea anyways. Yeah. Take it from us. We just had to do a data disclosure. Um, there was an exposure, possibly. So um, having uh, two-factor two fa authentication on your account is good no matter what. I wish all sites did that. So it's a good idea. Not Password data wasn't leaked, but yeah. If your password does get, you know, exposed by some website uh, or you reuse your password, which you shouldn't do, but a lot of people do anyways, uh, two-factor yeah. is another level so of protection. So free OTP works well. Someone just set it up on the iPhone. Um, two-factor in this day and age should be everywhere. Agree. Um, and then someone wanted to know where to find the DIY 
Uh, just go to learn.adafruit.com and type in TOTP. Um, that's the that's the way of. It's a very simple um, hashing system. That's not, there's no secret sauce to it. You know, you basically when you do this two-factor authentication, they give you a number, and then you hash that number with the current time. Like you put it together with the current time, you hash it, yeah. and that gives you that six-digit code. So. Anyways. Again, you, you can just run it totally. You don't want to have to run an app. You can run the code on your computer. All right. So slightly different mailbag this week uh, because we're basically talking to a bot. But there's a real human behind it. And um, thank you, everyone, for understanding. And uh, we're trying to keep it as fair as possible. Hopefully, We this want to out. get the pies to the individuals. And so yeah, this, is, will... this is the steps we're taking. You know, as soon as the Raspberry Pis are available, um, we will remove yeah. this limitation. OK. Next up, it is now time for some retro. I need something like spherical in my life. Yeah, so this is the future we could have had. So this is a mouse. This is from, oh, you want to get that? You want to put it on the Oh, yeah. yeah, hold on. Yeah, so I'm going to show the photos, and Lady is going to show this. This is from, I think, 1999. It's got Same. a 90s feel to it, kind of 80s and 90s. Yeah. So this is the space hold ball on. from hold on. Space Tech. Space ball. Hold on. And uh, okay. it came with a little uh, card on how to use it, the quick reference. It I'm has eight I'm buttons. Ready. Okay. Wanna... So uh, here. Yeah. So this is like a little sphere, and it has a little yeah. bit of give. Not a lot of give, but like it doesn't rotate in place. Yeah. And there's a little nipple. Yeah. And nipple. you can go this way. Yeah, you and can you can see, see it. it. I can yeah. See. This and this is... was used for 3D rendering and more. And then maybe on the other side, let's check out and see if it has a date on it. Um, it has a serial number. It says QA tested. It says model to 2003, but I don't think that's the model. I don't see a date code. It has a patent. And it says assembled in the United States, which is pretty cool. And then it's got like PS2. Okay. So uh, that's our first retro thing that we wanted to show. And the next one, um, this is really cool. We have this here. This is the Panasonic Transistor Radio R72 Tuta Loop. And 1972 is when it came out. And this is another glimpse of a possible future. And doesn't mean we have to design things that all look the same, like. Uh, and this isn't like the MoMA. Black rectangles. Yeah, this collection. is in the MoMA. And uh, this is in the Adafruit collection. And it's a FM radio. And you could see. AM radio. Um, right? I think it's an AM radio. Yeah. Not FM. Well, you're going to take it out of the box to find I out. Don't, I don't know. Yeah. I guess I have to. Sorry for, wait, yeah. how do I take it out of the box? It's triangular. Do you have to open it from the bottom? What? Triangle box. Triangle box. No, you can't pull it out, right? Because you have to. It... Well, we're doing the, the video here, so, and I think, okay. uh, all right. Yeah, it's, it's AM. All right, so I'm going to do the overhead? Yes. OK. OK, so it's an AM radio, and then this is the dial where you can tune it. This is the on-off. Yeah, you can turn it on. Well, where's the on-off? I think, I think the batteries are. In I there. think the battery's dead. The batteries. Oh, yeah. The battery's left dead. It on. Whoops. It was two um, looping all night. Yeah. So it uses a nine volt. Yeah, and you can um, you could wear it. That was one of the things yeah. you could wear it. Fashion. As a, as a as a thing. So now I have a two loop bracelet. Two loop bracelet. That's so bad. Yeah. Oh, Goes no. great with your bell bottoms. Yeah. Um, I like this dial. It's a fashionable dial. Yeah. So yeah, AM radio, and then there's also a headphone jack. But there's a built-in speaker here, too. Made in Japan. OK. Do loop. And that's this week's retro. Um, we'll be posting something every single day. It's a good idea to look back in time, get inspirations for designs that you may want to do. Not everything needs to just be a uh, black rectangle. Um, you could do a lot, especially now with 3D printers. And uh, be inspired. There's a lot of uh, folks that are still using some retro hardware for input devices. We found the protocols, so we're going to try to get this to work with CircuitPython. It's one of our projects. We will let you know when this is done. But look at this thing. Nothing says 90s like this. I'll tell you what it is. It's the totally unnecessary grid. Like, the grid is not useful at all. There's no purpose to it. It's not like the sphere moves within the grid. It's just like it's got yeah. a grid. And, you know, I don't know for sure, but I, there's got to be someone still around who worked on this. Get a hold of us. It'd be nice to know, like, what went into this. 
Um, Some like guy in Osaka or something. Yeah, I mean, like there's there's someone out there that knows a lot about this. I've been looking around online. Um, it's just like a lost history. It's like, how did this happen? And and if you think about it, if, look at these des these designs. Panasonic. This was seventy uh, two. So when did um, the Max come out? I mean, uh, this the was... first Apple. No, the Apples were around in like what seventy. Yeah. So they, so these all existed all at the same time, like different different yeah. versions of of Apple and Panasonic, and it and it's interesting because Panasonic, you don't really associate with them with like music players, you know, they're like cameras and like industrial stuff. I think and they like, did stereos, but this is I you know I think everyone was doing transistor radios. This was yeah. a really big deal. Yeah, we we should another one. I mean, it's somewhere. cool. You could play any music you wanted that was being transmitted and and listen yeah. to, to bops. All right, so Maybe that's... Maybe uh, surf vacations, I don't know. So that's, this, that's this week's retro, lots of round things. Okay, it's Python and Homework time. Plinkle, 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 plinkle. All right, uh, this week I'm going to skip down in the newsletter to the bottom, and then we're going to pop up to the top. So, uh, newsletter stuff this week. Do check out all of the hardware that's out there. Um, this is a Raspberry Pi Pico Power 3D mouse with Circuit Python. There is a pseudo Linux written in CircuitPython for the Raspberry Pi. There is a objectifying of the Joypad. It's the mm -hmm. user's code.py will now be clean and simple. Create an instance of Joypad and then just process the key events while true loop. The code is also uh, able to detect the libraries and uh, provides links. There is some um, badge OS. Uh, from the Pymeroni project that's ported over to CircuitPython, so you can okay. use the Pymeroni um, cool e-ink badge that they just made. With we Circuit have Python. very good e-ink support, yeah. and obviously for the mag tag, we did a lot of low power stuff too. Yep, um, you can check out Circuit Python 7.2.0 on the Espresso RIS-5 ESP32 C3 dev board. More e-ink displays, and this. Oh, uh, I guess this is another one. Uh, Pipkin is a tool for installing distribution packages for MicroPython and CircuitPython. If you're managing a lot of libraries, it must be might be interesting to you. And then more hardware Python Lots of stuff projects in this week. and more. And so the highlights of the week um, that I wanted to show was first up, we have a new version of CircuitPython. It's seven to one. Um, I guess the big thing is we fixed the big thing was we fixed a SAMD auto reload. Yeah. There was a little bit of a like it was a marginal thing. thing. Did a couple of, you know version uh, updates. Um, so mostly bug fixes. All right. Keep and keep putting in those bug issues. We're gonna fix them. Anne was on the Python Bytes Python stream. The latest episode of the CircuitPython show came out. This is Professor John Gallagher, who, uh, let's see, John Gallagher is, sorry, March 15th, that was yesterday. Les Pounder was March 8th, that was last week. Yeah. So there's already uh, a lot of episodes. There's three episodes. Check it out. Um, and then speaking of Professor John Gallagher, here's uh, two tutorials as we include this in our newsletter. This is Raspberry Pi drum board um, for this Raspberry Pi CircuitPython school, and then also uh, physical computing with Professor John Gallagher, STEM QT on a Raspberry Pi with Quick. Um, another stream, Tammy Makes Things, CircuitPython stream, and another cool keyboard, RP2040 base keyboard controller that you can use with CircuitPython. All this stuff is available in Adafruit Daily. It's our separate website just for newsletters. Go to adafruitdaily.com. We deliver these every single week. And that is your Python on hardware news for this week. OK, Lady Ada, we're open source hardware company. We have 2,638 guides. What is on the big board this week? OK, this week we've got, uh, I published a quick guide for the ESP32 C3. Uh, a lot of folks got this board. I'll tell you, actually, I didn't realize we actually had put it in stock because it went in and sold out so quickly. I didn't, I didn't get a chance to uh, to notice. Um, so, um, uh, you know, I put a pinouts and some Arduino uh, example code and some MicroPython code. Uh, CircuitPython doesn't quite support this board yet, but um, I did use MicroPython with a lot of success. So, um, you know, I, I tossed in a page there just to show how to to get Wi-Fi working in, in MicroPython with the Risk five uh, C3, that's last week's new product. And then Pedro did a 3D printed heel clip project with these cool new Nikes that um, can, you can like 3D print yeah. and attach stuff onto. I actually have them right here. Yeah, so they're like attachable. Yeah, so why don't we go to the overhead on this. So I thought yeah. these were neat. It's a, 
Um, Sorry, I gotta move my toodle loop. Yeah, it's a it's a collab. Um, let me find the. So it comes with this little like dog tag thing, and that's how that's they're like, oh, this is how you. I, I think you should use a screwdriver. Yeah, by the but way. I think they're being hardcore. But they're just like, oh, this is this is the thing that you can use, and you unscrew this, and then you take these off, and you can put different things. On. Other ones. Kind of neat. It's the first time I've seen shoes that are specifically made um, to have 3D printed stuff. And this is injection molded, but you could 3D print your own. Yeah. Like this design isn't too difficult to 3D print. It looks like there's no serious overhangs. Yeah, and it's a chromy, chrome. A acronym? Acronym. 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 Okay. Well, yeah. they made, um, they, you know, modeled it. And so if you want to do your own 3D printed yeah. shapes. I'm going to show the video in a minute yeah. or so. Anyways, those are shoes. Shoes. And then... Um, 3D printed shoes. Sorry, there's like two more guides. Yeah. And then uh, we've got the guide up for the ESP32 Feather V2. Um, this is like a total re-spin of our ESP32 Feather, so check it out if you've got one of these. Um, there's a lot of extras, so we have to document all of them. So we have um, Arduino code example um, for like I2C and Wi-Fi and NeoPixel. And finally, um, for the RFID Wiz, which is this kind of cool standalone... RFID tag, you know, program, like uh, access um, memorizer and user type thing. It's like basically you can use RFID cards to have an activity occur. Um, just, uh, they was originally designed for escape rooms or interactive exhibits where like a card would unlock something or turn something on. Um, and the company that was doing these exhibits and escape rooms was like, some people want these, we're gonna make a product. Um, they wrote a, a really nice detailed tutorial um, with all of the, there's a lot of little details um, that they went into um, with the RFID Wiz. So if you need a project, you don't wanna do any soldering, you don't wanna do any coding, you just want access cards or like a bracelet to open a door or turn something on or turn something off, um, check out the RFID Wiz, check out the guide to see if you can do it and then uh, you can pick one up. Okay. Let's do some factory footage. And it wouldn't be Adafruit Factory footage unless we had a shot of what's going on outside the window here. This is the Disney headquarters. And it's a pretty calm day. You can't hear it. It's so loud. It's loud. <laughs> Time lapses. They, they should uh, compress all the loudness, too. No, that's okay. People wouldn't enjoy them as much. All right, 3D printing. Zip, 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 zip. We have two things that we're going to show. I'm going to show these back to back. I'm going to show the uh, shoes um, because uh, we did a custom version, and I think it's the only one so far that I've seen that's not. Are these also kind of like cut up in a cool way? Is that normal? Yeah, they're, yeah, they're supposed to look cool. Okay. These are, cool. these are these are these are too cool. They're for deconstructed. Us. Yeah, they're supposed to be. Okay. Like that. Um, Modern. Postmodern. And then we're going to, um, and then I'm going to play the speed up. Take it away, Noam Pedro. Hey, what's up, folks? In this project, we're making 3D printed heel clips for the Nike Acronym Blazer Low sneakers. We designed custom parts to fit NeoPixel LEDs in Adafruit Circuit Playground. These shoes have threaded inserts so you can easily attach 3D printed props and accessories. Our rocket-inspired boosters are motion activated so they'll light up and animate when you jump up or take a step.
you can easily program LED animations using Microsoft's Make Code. This is a block-based programming editor that we think is great for folks who are just getting started. The hardware simulator lets you test your code so you can write programs with just the Google Chrome browser. You can connect your board and upload your code over USB. Make Code is free and supports other hardware, so be sure to check it out. We think it's great for folks who are teaching in educational settings and workshops. You can get the parts to build this project, links are in the description. The parts are 3D printed using PLA filament. The wires are routed through the boosters and attached to the heel clip using machine screws. Be sure to check out the learn guide for a full step-by-step -step tutorial on building this project. The NeoPixels are press fitted into covers that are screwed into the boosters making this a modular design. The circuit playground is fitted into a clear case and gets attached to the heel clip with a tripod screw adapter. Alligator clips make it easy to connect the NeoPixels to the large pads on the circuit playground. The battery is fitted into a protected case that is secured to the heel clip with additional machine screws. A JST extension cable makes it easy to plug directly into the circuit playground. The heel clip assembly is fitted over the sneaker with the mounting holes nicely lined up. Thumb screws make it nice and easy to secure them without having to use a screwdriver. We think it's really cool that Nike made shoes for 3D printing and they're a really cool platform for the DIY maker community. We hope this inspires you to check out Adafruit Circuit Playground with MakeCode. Thanks for watching and be sure to subscribe for more projects from Adafruit. Okay, and don't forget, every single Wednesday, you can learn how to make all this stuff and more. This is uh, one of the things that they were showing off today, and it's cool. This is the Etch-A-Sketch. Carter yeah. wrote the code, Don Pedro did the 3D print. It was a project from a couple weeks ago. Yeah, cool. Okay, uh, before we go into Ion MPI, a little reminder, the code is BFF add-on. 10% off native fruit store all the way up to 11.59 p.m. Buffer and, Don. Uh, Buffer Don, yeah. And don't forget, um, coming up later, in the next week's months, just make sure you have an Adafruit account and it's two-factor authenticated because that's how we're gonna be deploying a lot of things like Raspberry Pi notifications because there's not enough of them for everybody and this is a way to make sure it's fair. It's a little reminder. Okay, let's do I on MPI. That's right. I on MPI. Okay, I on MPI, brought to you by DigiKey and Adafruit. Lady Ada, what is this week's Ion MPI? Okay, this week's Ion MPI is by Murata. Uh, they make all sorts of precision industrial sensors and devices. Uh, we've covered them before um, from some of their power supply stuff, including a cool video. Um, but this week, we're going to uh, cover a interesting part I've never used before. It's an inclinometer. Uh, this is the SCL3300 inclinometer. It is um, a sensor that, as you may guess, measures inclines, tilt. Um, uh, so this is a, a fairly new uh, sensor. It's got a SPI uh, interface. Um, you know, it's kind of this big chunky piece, uh, you know, runs on three volts and uh, will give you both acceleration out and angle, tilt angle, uh, has a couple different modes and we'll go into those in more detail. Um, so the first thing you might be wondering is, well, wait a minute, you know, an inclin inclinometer measures tilt against, uh, you know, the Earth's gravitational field. Because, you know, the ground may not be flat, but the center of Earth, the, the where gravity points towards, is going to be a constant. And so that's a good way of measuring what's flat. 
Um, and a lot of people, you know, engineers who might be watching will be like, hey, you know, why don't you just use an accelerometer? Uh, accelerometer measures gravity. And then when you measure gravity um, against three axes, you can tell where the vector of gravity is pointing. And then you kind of do a little bit of sine cosine action there. Um, as shown here, this is a, a nice app note, I think, um, that I found either from ST or NXP. You can do the math and figure out what the angle and uh, the, the three, uh, 3D angle vector is um, towards center of gravity. Um, that's your tilt. So why not just use an accelerometer? Um, and we do have a lot of accelerometers. And one of the demos that we often have for accelerometers is, you know, yes, taking that, um, taking the, the meters per second squared measurement, um, you know, if something's totally flat against the ground, um, the X will be zero, the Y will be zero, um, and the Z will be um, negative 9.8 meters per second squared, because um, that's your gravitational force. And of course, if you're moving it, you'll get the acceleration of motion as well as the acceleration of gravity. But yeah, you know, as long as things are staying still, yes, you can measure tilt. Um, and the answer is yes, you, you can use an accelerometer for that. However, um, accelerometers tend to be designed for, you know, high motion. They're, they're meant for, you know, a, a game, a toy, or a detecting tilt for a monitor, whether, or a phone, whether you've tilted it um, for landscape or portrait. They're not designed for very delicate, small angle measurements. Um, so for example, here, this is a, you know, a common accelerometer, and you can see when you get into the highest resolution mode possible, you get one uh, milli G, uh, G is you know, 9.8 meters, et cetera, et cetera, per second, one G, one milli G per low, you know, least significant digit. Um, whereas for the SCL3300, they have it in inverse. They say the best is gonna be 12,000 LSB per G if you invert it, blah, blah, blah. It's 0 0.08, so it's about you know, 12, 15 times more precise than um, you know, even a 2G accelerometer. Uh, so basically, it's, it is an accelerometer, but it's a very, very precise, stable, and accurate accelerometer that won't have a very high range on purpose because it's designed to um, measure just gravitational, like it, it doesn't really go above, as you see, 1.2G. Um, it's designed really to only measure small changes in tilt and um, you know, incline, not motion. Like this is a very bad sensor if you want to measure um, a tap or a hit or you know, a car acceleration, um, not good. Very good for it staying very still. It's on a piece of equipment or it's on a, um, a bridge or a building and it's measuring uh, the tilt changes. Another thing is um, compared to low cost accelerometers, you're gonna have much, much better uh, temperature uh, stability um, and also um, just offset uh, stability over time. So, you know, using these sensors, they're basically just like really, 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 really good accelerometers that are not meant for active motion. And so you're gonna pay more because it is, you know, 10, 20 times more precise and more accurate. Um, you're gonna get a lot more bits of precision um, you're gonna get a, a lot more accuracy as well, um, and you're gonna pay for it. And usually accelerometers, again, they're not designed for this. So it's kind of a subset of an accelerometer. Um, another thing is the noise density. Um, here is a, um, sorry, this, this is the L SCL3300, so you can see um, the best noise density is about 15 micro G per uh, root hertz. And then um, for a common, sorry, one moment. For a common uh, accelerometer, uh, you're gonna get 220 micro G per root hertz. So, you know, basically, um, again, 10 to 15 uh, times uh, lower noise, um, which is important because you wanna make sure like not only are you getting um, the, the data, but you're not gonna get a lot of uh, variation in the data because uh, it's meant for long-term measurements. Okay. Um, uh, last see, yeah. Um, last up, um, like many um, sensors that are designed for, um, you know, industrial or uh, robotic uses, um, the uh, data has, uh, you know, status. There you can get status of the sensor, which I think is really important. And there's a CRC checksum uh, for SPI as well. So, you know, you can make sure that the data you're sending and receiving 
uh, comes in correctly. Um, you don't have any bit errors due to uh, noise or what have you. Um, something that I look for in, in, a, in a good quality sensor. If you're paying the money for an inclinometer, uh, you want to make sure the data you're getting is really um, the right data. Also available in an eval board. Um, if you want to get started real quickly, um, this eval board has all the little passives ready for you. It's a breadboard friendly. It's got uh, big honking mounting holes, uh, four of them, so you can stay nice and secure. And then um, you, know, you can read the SPI data out with any microcontroller or microcomputer. Available on DigiKey. It's in stock. Yeah, this is a screenshot from just right before the show. It's, it's available, you can buy it. Um, so that's really important. Um, and I looked, and as, as, for inclinometers, this is definitely the least expensive um, inclinometer, but it's fully featured, uh, and I think will do the job quite well for all sorts of industrial and robotic purposes. Okay, and we have a video. Yes, this, so I'll say one thing, the video is for the SCA3300, that's the accelerometer version, but it's, I believe they're either very similar or this is a reprogrammed version, it's the same functionality, it's just this is the inclinometer output, not the accelerometer output. this week's Eye on MPI. Eye on MPI. Okay, before we go off into new product land, BFF add-on is the code, and you'll figure that in a second. Here we go, you ready, Lady Ada? Yes, it's time for the new, 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 All right, so first up, we have a revision. We do. We're going to see a lot of revisions in the coming months because if I can't get parts, I have to revise the board and sometimes I kind of do a little bit more revision because like I'm in there, might as well fix a couple other things. Uh, so this is the USB Ultimate GS, uh, sorry, USB Ultimate GPS, a lot of TLAs in there. Uh, this is a USB friendly version of our Ultimate GPS board, a very popular um, GNS, uh, which allows you to uh, get data from the sky to get the exact time um, and also your exact location. Handy for all sorts of purposes. Um, this one has both the built-in antenna and also you can uh, connect an external antenna so you can use it indoors, have the an antenna outside. Uh, so this revision, uh, what we did is we changed the CP2104 chip for a CP2102N. Shouldn't affect anything. The driver's the same, functionality's the same. And while we were at it, we also changed the micro B to a USB-C. Why not? Also changed a couple parts to uh, 0603 instead of 0805. But otherwise, the layout's the same, the shape's the same, functionality is identical. Um, you'll just want a USB-C cable. We're kind of moving stuff to USB-C because that's the future, or it's the, it's the present, and the micro USB is in the past. Okay, next up. Uh, next up, this is a slightly bigger revision. This is the Feather ESP32 S2 with BME uh, 280 sensor. Um, so this was very popular, and then after I released it, I realized that uh, I had made a decision with the I squared C pull up resistors that ended up causing uh, higher power draw during deep sleep mode um, if you were using sensors on the QT port. Um, and so I was like, well, you know, I should revise this. And I've also learned a little bit more about uh, low power stuff. So instead of a transistor to switch on and off the power to the QT port, I've actually just thrown on another LDO. So there's uh, two um, low dropout regulators, one for the NeoPixel and I2C, one for the main board. And that means you can easily cut power to the NeoPixel 
and I squared C. So even if you have stuff plugged into the QT port, uh, you'll be able to get that 70 microamp um, low power draw in deep sleep. And um, we're also going to have the version without the BME 280 um, released into the store soon, but we wanted to start with this version. So just uh, showing a little quick demo, because I don't think I showed this demo before. Oh, this was, this was set up for the Tuda loop. Hold on. Second, let me, I gotta get my inclinometer so I can get this nice and straight. Uh, so this is just showing that um, here I've got the temperature, humidity, and pressure sensor. I also got a battery monitor. Oh, there's no battery installed. So that's why it's like, there's no battery. But um, if the battery was installed, shall I find one? Hold on, one moment. One second, let me just, uh, I want to reset this completely. Okay, so uh, now the battery voltage is more correct. So, um, and you can see it's running off a battery. So uh, there's a LiPo monitor, which gives you percentage and uh, voltage. It's a nice little um, uh, I squared C monitor. Uh, the ESP32 S2 is a native USB um, version of the ESP32. It's a single core, 10 silica, 240 megahertz. Wi-Fi, no Bluetooth support uh, at all in it. Um, the S3 has BLE and we'll, we'll come out with that later. However, it does have four megabytes of flash and two megabytes of PS RAM, which is super handy if you need uh, large buffers. Um, so the big change really was just, again, that little uh, LDO over here um, just got updated so it can be uh, lower power in low power mode. Um, so the guide will be updated with the new schematic, but otherwise it's um, very functionally similar. Um, to the polarity of how to turn on and off the power for the QT port did change. But we're gonna have a little bit of chunk of code that no matter which version you have, it'll turn it on or off uh, as desired. So um, that's it, that's the okay. update to the S2. Next up. Next up we have a, a cute uh, kind of round panel mount, um, 3.5 millimeter uh, stereo adapter. Uh, we had a smaller one. Um, we actually got sent these by accident, but they were so cute. We're like, we'll just put them in the store. Um, these are really easy to mount if you don't want to cut a square hole or, or you want, you know, you have a rough edges. Um, it's, it's a very large flanged connector. It hides, um, you know, any burrs in the hole quite, uh, quite nicely. And so we like these for, for panel mounting um, because uh, even somebody with just a simple hole saw um, can cut it into almost any material. Okay, and then the start of the show tonight, besides you, Lady, to our team, our customers, our community, and the Adafruit staff that's running things behind the scenes tonight is? This is the uh, LiPo BFF, mostly because I couldn't come up with a better name in time. So this is sort of like a shield or a, a wing or um, a hat for uh, cutie pies. So, um, you know, we wanted to make a couple add-ons. One common add-on that people uh, wanted was the ability to, uh, especially for the Wi-Fi boards, to have a battery plug in and have the battery charge. We didn't have enough space on the cutie pie to add charging circuitry or a LiPo connector. Um, but this little uh, BFF solders onto the back and kind of gives you a lot of functionality. So there's uh, the battery port, of course. You can use any 200 milliamp hour battery or larger. There's an on-off switch. Um, let's go to the, uh, let's go here. There's an on-off switch. Um, so, you know, if, you, if you're portable, you don't have to unplug the battery to turn it on or off. Um, there is, uh, the, the voltage from the battery is then dioded back into the five volt pin because there isn't like a separate battery in on um, the cutie pie or the, the shell that it's based off of. Um, and there's a uh, voltage divider on A2, which you can cut this little jumper if you wanna cut the voltage divider. And the voltage divider um, lets you um, monitor the voltage on the five volt pin not the battery of the five volt pin, which actually has a bit of a side effect that it lets you determine roughly whether uh, the board is being charged or is running off of the battery. Because you can, if the, if the voltage on the five volt pin is above about 4.2 volts, it's the five volt power coming in from USB. If it's below 4.2 volts, it's most likely running off of the LiPo battery. Um, so I've got the little demo, although I don't know if I, I might have reprogrammed this board by accident. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, but we have the video, so show yeah, the video. Yeah, let's do the video. So um, 
you can see, turn it off, turn it on, it's running off a of LiPo, plug it in, it knows it's running off of USB. Unplug USB, it knows it's running off of LiPo okay, again. Okay, that's smart. Yeah, so I got okay. the demo down to six seconds, um, and but then I was messing with it. is new products. New, 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 new. Okay. Um, there's a couple questions lined up in the chat. Go over to Discord, adafruit.it slash Discord. We're going to answer them in just a few minutes. Let's do some top secret. Okay. Okay. Uh, first up, here is a uh, latest from Jepler with some cool floppy stuff. Okay, here we are, just finishing up writing a floppy with the Adafruit floppy prototype board and Flux Engine software on our standard computer. Let's take that hot off the presses floppy disk action there and put it in our vintage Apple IIe. So uh, this one instantly transports me back to the classroom, back to elementary school. Number Crunchers was maybe a game you got to play on a Friday afternoon when you got your one hour of computing time a week. And uh, yeah, you get to play as the Number Muncher with such fun games as Primes. Get ready to munch numbers. So uh, yeah, a couple cursor keys, hit space. Oh, oh shoot, one is not a prime number. Well, I hope we all learned something today. Have a great one. Okay, and then here is the latest thing that you're working on. Okay, this was kind of fun because, um, you know, it, there's this part shortage, and, and you know, I want to say, like, you didn't hear it from me, but you did hear it from me. Um, this part shortage is probably going to continue for another 18 months, um, so you should assume that anything you can't get, it's going to be another 18 months till you'll be able to get parts the way you used to um, about a year ago uh, or a year and a half ago. Um, I know it's supposed to be over by now, but it's not. And um, I keep thinking of this um, aphorism that I read in a book. Um, Nothing is as permanent as a temporary situation. Um, anyways, so the PCF 8523 is a, an RTC that we uh, know and love. We use it in our breakouts. Um, it's inexpensive. It's battery backed. It's three or five volt compatible. It's a really wonderful RTC, which is probably why I can't get any. I ordered some about a year ago and uh, I'm still waiting on a shipment. Um, but I was able to snag some in uh, HVSON. And so you can see the previous version just had SOIC in it. I now have this new PCB, which has both SOIC and HVSON because I don't want to cancel my SOIC order because like once you book an order, like you're in line, I, you know, I might as well stay in line like a clown. Um, but while I can get some of the HVSON versions, um, I'm going to be doing some revisions. So, you know, we revised all of our CP2104 boards to CP2102N. That's been exciting. I'm almost done with that. Um, and then, you know, next up is we have three or four boards that use the PCF8523. That's uh, top secret. Get back in that vault. Okay, so don't forget, um, that's code BFF add-on. I'm going to go over to questions, and I have a couple lined up already. Yeah. Do, do, do. Oh, oh, wait, you know the battery was dead because I left it plugged in. Oh, yeah? Do you want to uh, show yeah, it? Yeah, maybe I'll show the yeah, demo. Here, I'm here, sorry, yeah. it's so embarrassing. I was like, keep, why is it working? Keep lining up your questions. Okay, okay line will, up your questions. Okay, okay well, so look. folks like the uh, Cutie Pie and BFF, those are wholesome words together. Um, more of a comment versus a question. Um, does anyone heard if there's going to be a Maker Faire in New York this year? So I believe there is a Maker Faire in Long Island because I was corresponding with them there, but not in um, New York City. So uh, check out Maker Fair Long Island with that. Um, next up, you want to keep showing that thing or what else? Yeah, I'm just that? turning it on and off. I'm like, look, if there's an on-off switch. Isn't that wonderful? I don't want to kill this battery now. Um, I missed the part. Will it charge the battery from the USB power? Oh, yeah, it, it does. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it does the one thing it was meant to do. <laughs> okay. like it charges the battery as well. This is the charge light. All right. Um, question for you, Lady Ada. Do you think uh, it's going to be another 18 months for parts? Yes, I do. I, I believe it's going to be 18 months. Yeah. We, um, think, it, we think it's going to be that. Look, I, right. I don't have personal insight. I just... Um, I just sometimes, like, I'm, like, kind of one with the supply chain sometimes. <laughs> 
it's going to be 18 months, but not for everything. Some, some things are available. Um, some things are not, but what I'm noticing is there's parts that I ordered a year ago. It's been 52 weeks and I'm like, so 52 week lead time, right? So like, you're going to get me that wheel of parts. And they're like, no ETA. Okay. Um, so yeah, 18, 18 more months. Next up. We need, uh, we need like a groundhog that sees its shadow. What's something. the possibility of a dual microcontroller board, such as the ESP32 or RP2040 with two chips for the purpose of passing off tasks leaving the main? Microcontroller for speed and code execution. Users could uh, be machine learning, DVI, HDMI, camera projects, et cetera. Um, I mean, I think you can have, you know, we do do that, right? Like the Matrix Portal um, and the Pi Portal are two boards that have two microcontrollers. We have a SAMD51 as the main core, and then we have the ESP32 as a Wi-Fi subprocessor that takes in SPI commands. Um, I, I personally kind of loathe um, having two microcontrollers on a board. I think it's um, really tough to do. It's really tough to do well. Um, it's hard enough writing code for one microcontroller. Now you've got two. And it's not doesn't make it twice as hard. It makes it like 10 times as hard. Because like microcontrollers, yeah. you know the thing about like chips is like there's little details like instant response to interrupts that you know you're expecting. And there's like, what if it's in the middle of a task and you're expecting it as an IRQ line? And what if you miss it? So, you know, there are dual boards. A lot of the times what you will see is, is yes, the, the ESP32 is a very common one. I think doing more than that is quite challenging because now you've reinvented RPC and, and it took us like a good 10 years to get that right. And we had infinite memory. Okay, uh, next up, this is more of a public service now. It's bootleg chips, yep, everyone should be watching out for that. Uh, in my professional life, I had to deal with bootleg chips, specifically encoder chips. Even though it might be suddenly be available, does not mean it is the real thing. Yes, the first, the first kit I sold, I was, I got hit badly with uh, totally fraudulent chips. Um, I needed, for the Zox box, some BA6110s. They were hard to get. Um, I had a vendor, and it's interesting, you know, they're all gray market because they were no longer made. Um, I had a vendor who had sold me, a, you know, a couple hundred and they were good. And then the next batch I ordered um, were completely blank, like diode checked it. There was nothing in it. It was empty plastic, uh, looked the same. The date code was the only thing that was identifiable. And I had to ship to every customer a new chip. Thankfully, it was, a, you know, a part that you could replace um, by the user. But... Um, absolutely, counterfeit chips are gonna be a problem. I'd be very, well here's, there's, there's good news and there's bad news, right? Um, the bad news is there's counterfeit chips. The good news is that the prices that gray market people are asking for chips are so totally out of control bonkers that you're probably not gonna get them anyways because like why would you pay $30 for something even if it was real when you normally pay like $1.50? So I think, you know, the, the best bet is, is, I think honestly, if you can't find it, sorry, if, if you see a part, it's probably not real or it's super expensive, you, you should just redesign. But yes, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say, I think it's gonna be 18 months. Okay, um, next up, are we gonna carry the Blues Wireless Swan board and their cellular data modem? It's a feather, that, uh, is it, it is a feather that supports CircuitPython. I don't know if it is. Um, if it uses the NR52840, then yes, it supports CircuitPython because any NR52840 can. I think we chatted with them and then I think we both got slammed and we didn't uh, continue the conversation. But um, we might. Um, it's been hard for a lot of people to carry wireless chips. Wireless chips have been specifically challenging. Um, if it's a board that's an NR52840 and you want to add CircuitPython support to it, because uh, it's feather shaped, uh, either ask them, we have a guide, or open up an issue in our CircuitPython repo. Okay. Um, someone in the other chat in the beginning of the show asked if we were going to go over our data disclosure we did last week. You can watch it on the, we spent, I think, like 40 30, minutes. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a permanent post on our website along with any other previous security disclosures. And we update this frequently because some people, um, including ourselves, uh, have to continually put better descriptions, different descriptions, additional descriptions of anything that's possible with data disclosing. So check it out there. You can also look at our video. You can also email us, security at if you have any questions. Um, you know, knock on wood, we don't think the data got out there, but we wanted to do a responsible disclosure. Um, someone said it's more like an exposure notification. Um, 
we're going to always tell yeah. everybody everything we possibly can. And I apologize if we don't get it right the first time. We did a disclosure post. And then some folks said, I also want an email. And we're like, you're right. We sent an email one business day later. So we'll continue to alert customers for absolutely anything that ever comes up. That is our promise yep. to you. And we'll keep updating it. Some people have questions about words that we used and they yeah. interpret one way and we didn't mean them that way. It's not a big deal. We'll, yeah. we'll keep updating the post and also And I think um, next time I'm going to do a Twitter Spaces uh, Q&A because that's where a lot of the questions came from and it's real time. So I think that's one of my lessons learned yeah. as well. All right. Uh, let me see if there's any more questions. Do, do, do. I got a 3D printer today. Uh, hey, should I set up Octoprint? Guess what? Can't get a Raspberry Pi for under $120 anymore. The, two, uh, the 2B isn't sufficient. I'm guessing I'm also going to be 18 months on uh, being able to actually get that. Well, Kevin, here's what you do. Go to adafruit.com, make an account, verify it, do two-factor authentication, and today... Uh, we'll try our best. People got emails and they were able to purchase the Raspberry Pi, I think specifically for their 3D printers. Yeah. So um, I don't think you'll have to spend that much money. Um, one thing Adafruit's not going to do, we're not going to charge more than uh, we have before for Raspberry Pis unless our price goes up. Um, but we're not going to charge We're charging. We're yeah. charging the, the price that it is. Um, you know, I, I, the thing is, is that a lot of people um, got very addicted um, and reliant on the extreme surplus of very low cost single board Linux computers from the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Um, it was so awesome to be able to get, you know, for $35, a, a full Linux computer that could run Octoprint. Um, you know, Octoprint, it, I, I don't know, it's not going to be 18 it's not going to be 18 months until you get a Raspberry Pi again, but it might be 18 months until there's a steady, consistent supply of all the different Raspberry Pis. Because I know that, like any vendor, you know, they're going to prioritize some boards over others. Um, so I, I, what the priority is, I don't know, but, um, you know, they do have a limited number of chips. Um, they're probably going to use them on the most popular products to get them out there. Okay. Um, that said, uh, you can get a Raspberry Pi 400. Now, it's, it's a little bigger. <laughs> But it is a Pi 4, yes. uh, and you get a keyboard for free with it, right? Uh, so you can, you can use that. I know it's more expensive, but it is a Pi 4 inside. It has a GPIO header. It has, um, I believe, the Ethernet and everything ports. Uh, so you should be able to use it, okay. uh, control your 3D um, printer. One more question. Uh, well, from this person. Uh, what's your recommendation for storing STEMA sensors? Also, thanks. I'm sorry, what? Like, like, like what? Um, for storing STEMA sensors. Kind of a like an like anti like okay, anti static box. Uh, I have a little you know we used to have little storage boxes. I mean yeah. they're small. They're you could put them in a bead box okay. or something. Or yeah, everyone's having box. trouble sourcing parts. Yep, us too. Um, when are you planning on getting more of the Touring Complete Labs 10-digit monochrome display? Or else you will decide uh, if the test runs were successful for a third-party board. Uh, we booked them, but um, guess what? They're a silicon shortage, so they're probably also having difficulty. Uh, there's really no ETAs available for stuff, but we did book an okay. order for a refill. Uh, I'll do two more questions. Uh, so someone did sign up for emails, but maybe they didn't get one today. Yeah, we only got a few Raspberry Pis, so we you, only notify that number. We only notified the number that came in that we could notify. Because so, we wouldn't want to notify like 3,000 so, people for yeah. 200 boards. That's not fair. And you know, log into your account, and if it says you're already signed up for a thing, that means that you didn't get it. Also, make sure you check your spam folder. Um, next up. Uh, do we plan ahead what's in the Ada box for uh, the summer 2022 Ada boxes and fall? Yes. So we do. That we plan really far ahead. In fact, we planned so well last year, even when there was shutdowns with COVID and everything, or the year before, that we were able to deliver Ada box. It's just this latest part shortage is when things are starting to get a little bit more challenging. But we'll get all the Ada boxes out. Don't worry. Yeah. And you know, especially since like you know we ordered parts and then they're not delivered by the time, you know, it's like it used to be when you ordered something and they said they'd get it to you in 20 weeks, you'd actually get it in 20 weeks. That's not true anymore either. And so we are booking all the parts that we need for the future Ada boxes, but um, it's very hard to, it's hard to believe anything anymore. I've been hurt before um, by vendors. So, you know, we're yeah. doing the best we can, um, booking as many parts and, and trying to design around availability as much as possible. Okay. And that's questions. Okay. Thank you, everybody. So that is that's our show, show tonight. Special thanks to everyone in the community, all the customers, all the folks running things behind the scenes, including Takara. Thank you, Takara. Thank you, Takara. We'll see everybody uh, next week. Thank you so much. This has been an Adafruit production. Here is your moment of Zener. Bye, everybody. Bye.